Okay, um, I'm going to start now. Hi, Radha. Uh, Hello. Good evening. <laughs> Thank evening. you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. A very, very warm welcome to you to Doc Commune, uh, a mentoring initiative that has been started by the Public Service Broadcasting Trust in India, also known as the PSBT. Um, it is. Uh, it gives me such great delight to um, to have you as a guest over here today. I mean, I've known you for nearly a decade. I was thinking about it, uh, you know, and and I have to uh, tell everybody who's joining us right now that uh, Radha is just such an incredibly generous person. She's someone with a you know with with a lot of experience in documentary, and she's. Uh, so happy to share that information, you know, with uh, with all of us. And and every time I have met her, I have always taken away a bit of her warmth uh, with me. Uh, so thank you so much, Radha, for having joined us here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll uh, just quickly take everybody through uh, your background. Uh, so Radha uh, is a filmmaker. I mean, she was a filmmaker first and foremost. Her own films uh, were selected to more than 60 uh, festivals, awarded and screened across Europe, Asia, and uh, the US. Uh, one of the films was invited to be shown uh, and, archi and then archived at MoMA in uh, New York. Um, thereafter, she went to become a, a festival programmer. She's been a curator. She's taught film. She's been a lecturer. Uh, she's been a critic. So, you know, a really very, very vast body of work. Uh, and interestingly, also, um, uh, you know, there's been this connection with Indian films for a very, very long time uh, that uh, Radha has had. And she's also been, um, uh, you know, involved with some of the most exciting film festivals uh, across the world, both uh, as, you know, part of juries for the festivals uh, themselves and as part of uh, selection committees of um, film funds. Uh, and, you know, that includes it for Bertha, it includes uh, the Doha Film Fund, uh, there's the Rotterdam um, Rupert Bach uh, Film Fund. So she's done that. She's also been mentoring for many, many years and uh, mentoring in India as well. You know, she started at Srishti, she's been part of Dockage. Uh, there was a producer's lab I did at, at MIF in 2014. She was there as one of the, the experts there. So she's somebody who's Really, you know, she's she's got that outside eye, but she's also known and watched and interacted with Indian films and filmmakers for a very, very long time. In fact, she's taught Indian film, um, you know, in, in universities abroad. So Radha, as we begin uh, this conversation, I think the first thing um, I'd like to ask you is about your own interest in the documentary. You know, where did that emerge from? Uh, you know, how did you get interested in the nonfiction and what has your journey been like? First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really a great pleasure to be part of uh, this important platform. So I'm greeting uh, you, a partner, your team, and of course, everybody who is listening to us uh, now. And there are so many good filmmakers in India. So uh, I believe that there are at least young people who don't have so much experience to be today with us. Um, I am interested in documentaries uh, for a very, very long time, but now I would say even more and more because uh, temperature in the society is every day so high that uh, uh, every fiction story, if we think of, is just not interesting enough. So, and then why to, to, to come up with a fictional story when life is so exciting, so dramatic, so important. Uh, the stories are everywhere. You look uh, around in your neighborhood, you look uh, in your society, you look in some other country, you look the the global situation at the moment with the war in Ukraine. Uh, before uh, I'm originally from former Yugoslavia, we had war there as well and falling up uh, a part of the country. So every day is filled with excitement, with drama, with, uh, with uh, stories that have to be told, stories that people might not know of or not so well if we don't tell them in the documentaries. Because in fiction, if you tell the same story in the fiction, it cannot be so strong. Because when you see in a documentary that this incredible story of a family is happening exactly to this father and this mother and these kids, 
that this granny is the real person who survived what she's telling us in the film. It's much more strong and it hits us really uh, to the heart and mind and it stays with us. And that's the point of a, of a film, story to be told, and of art, film as an art form to stay with us, to move us, to make us be different persons. You know, one time Wim Wender said, I want film to change me. I want to come to cinema as one person and I want to come out as another person. So cinema has to do something with us. And documentary film is certainly cinematic form that has this power to strongly move us. That's why I'm so interested in documentary format of all kinds. Documentary is not one sort of a film. It has so many layers within documentary format. Absolutely. And um, so there is the documentary and, and I completely agree because there are, you know, there are just so many kinds of stories that we can tell. Um, within that sort of larger universe of documentaries, you know, your own engagement with Indian films and Indian filmmakers has been very significant. Um, tell us a little about that. What is it, you know, what drew you to India uh, to begin mm -hmm. with? You know, what about our stories? Yeah, it's, it's a long story. It started in 1990 uh, when I lived in uh, Sarajevo, in former Yugoslavia, and uh, uh, Sai Baba was a very known persona in Yugoslavia and in Eastern Europe. So there was one uh, production company that was interested in making film about Satya Sai Baba. So I was assistant director to a lady uh, Vesna Ljubic from Sarajevo, with whom I worked before. I was assistant director on her fiction feature films previously. And uh, just a small crew of a film director, uh, film, I mean, camera person, and one more managing person and myself, so four people, went to India for the first time in our lives. All of us were totally fresh, inexperienced, naive, and we went there uh, so that's time before internet, before uh, digital uh, banking or everything. So totally inexperienced, we landed up in Puta Party and worked on 16 millimeter uh, camera. Then later on, uh, we, we worked with some other people, not only with this team. We stayed uh, not one month as we planned due to different uh, situations that you can think of some inexperienced three ladies team and one man can find in India thousands of obstacles, thousands of opportunities to, you know, uh, I don't know, misguide us or whatever. So a lot to learn, a lot to uh, struggle with, but also this is one of the most exciting parts in my life because at that time uh, we stayed four months instead of one month. At that time in Chennai, when we were developing our uh, stock in, in Prasad Lab, there was a film festival, IFI. IFI at the time was traveling one time in Delhi and then next following year in some other capital of some states. So it was in Chennai at the time, Madras. And then I discovered totally different type of cinema. I discovered the world of uh, you know, poetry, of uh, uh, beauty, of different aesthetical approach. I watched so many Indian films so the, as you all know, if he is not screening Bollywood films, at least at that time, it didn't go for a flashy, uh, you know, uh, mainstream films, but for really good quality films, parallel cinema films, art house films. So Aravindan was there and many other directors. So I just, I was flabbergasted. I discovered something that spoke to me so much. And then at the same time, I met Indian audience. I was in the middle of the big cinema room. I watched Manika Ul's film and I was there and everything spoke to me from one side, images from the screen, different understanding of poetry, different understanding of usage of body language, of uh, dialogues, uh, the, the, this uh, multi-layered meanings and also simplicity in some point. At, at, this, at the same time, uh, this uh, encounter with Indian audience, this in amazing passion, enthusiasm of the Indian audience, which I actually discovered later on in the filmmakers 
as well. And that's why I have a big, big respect for Indian filmmakers, because they are one of the most passionate film artists, I would say, in the world. Right, and, and that was really just the beginning of, uh, you know, a long engagement uh, with Indian films. So, yes, I just wanted to say, uh, sorry, Aparna, I just wanted to say, I'm coming from Eastern Europe. So our cinema is also different a little bit than Western European cinema, not to mention American cinema, very different. So maybe it's a moment now that we see uh, out of focus trailer of one uh, documentary coming from Eastern Europe where we can see a filmmaker just observing what people are doing at one church on a hill, how they are reacting. There are tourists coming from 10 different countries or more, and they are all reacting in a similar but different way. So it's a, it's a beautifully short film. So I'm putting it here because Indian cinema has fantastic uh, DOPs, fantastic camera people with amazing eye. We work with Ramani, RV Ramani at our films. So these are people to, to really admire. I mean, we had actually first talk uh, uh, with, with some other people who worked even in uh, Bollywood uh, films, but we went for somebody who is really documentarian, who has a heart of a documentarian like Ramani. So let's just see this small, it's like one and a half minute of uh, one young uh, man from Croatia who made this film autofocus. Also like in India, all on his own, one man band. I mean, he shot it, he directed, he produced, he financed. That's not the best way to do it. People have to live from their work, but the passion and the enthusiasm that, that, that is devotion to make a film, it's there also big as much as in India. Right, so um, Punima, if you could play uh, autofocus for everybody. Thank you. It's okay, we can, uh, we can stop here, it's fine. We just can understand that this man is observing the whole film. I mean, the whole film looks like this more or less with going into the destinies of, of different people. But what I want to say in the cinema, it's really important to show rather than tell. By showing, you tell, but verbal, uh, the way of telling the story is something that has to be taught through cinematic language. So yes, documentaries do matter. They tell important story, but we always have to look how to use the cinematic language. And do you think that sometimes is um, perhaps, uh, you know, one of the failings of Indian documentary sometimes? Because I think the documentary tradition also evolved. Uh, you know, it has a certain history in India. Uh, and, and perhaps sometimes we are a little guilty of trying too hard to tell everybody what it is that we want to say and, you know, for everyone to be convinced and to understand what we're saying and to be, you know, to be converts by the end of the film, uh, you know, to whatever that particular theme is. Yeah, yeah indeed. 
documentaries uh, in India, let's say, come from, from a tradition of being educational, uh, being didactic, uh, being uh, simplistic in order to reach broad audience and to come with a, uh, with, with a message. Documentary as an art form should not have a message. It should have a story that transmits emotion. Cinema is all emotion. And this story has to be, the vehicle of the story has to be an emotion that is coming out of these images, coming out of the way how the story has been put together and so on. So it's not a message that you come out from cinema and now you, you learn something which is like one sentence. It's much more than that. I mean, if we talk about, I respect Indian filmmakers because they are, they are engaged uh, in, in, in a society, in changing society. They aim to tell important stories, political stories. Very often they are very brave people who, who risk their freedom, their uh, well-being by making this film. But nevertheless, they want to make a film because it's so important for them to address the audience. And I believe it's better to put more effort and to rethink your narrative to tell this story, this important story that they, you, you want to tell because it will reach more audience. It will reach audience in all India, but also audience abroad. And it's happening. I mean, we can say that it's almost in the past, this, let's say traditional or, or, or uh, didactic way of putting together narrative in documentaries, more and more Indian uh, directors are finding the way how to be original, fresh in their approach in telling the stories, and they really have a great uh, success. Look, uh, writing with fire. I mean, Indian uh, documentary reached Oscars. It's it's amazing. It's it's totally amazing. How many countries in this world don't uh, ever reach Oscars? To, to ever go so far? Neither with fiction or with documentaries. So it, they started small, but it was such a passion, their passion of the filmmakers to tell the story, to not, not to give up, not to, uh, uh, you know, say, okay, now I have enough advices of, of some consultants, now I go with it. No, they wanted to listen to everybody. I was part of Doc Edge, um, and I met them in the process several times, and there are people who are super smart, uh, talented, very talented, Yet they wanted to go through the process to develop more and more, more and more. And that's the problem in uh, very often in Indian documentaries, research, you know, period of preparation of research. It's not important just to know the story. You have to be with these characters for a long, long time to understand how they will behave in front of the camera, how, what they will do to prepare everything. You have to really get up in the morning at four o'clock to see what is the light there. Some some people just shoot, uh, you know, a certain light to follow certain uh, mood uh, in the film. So you can't, uh, you can compromise if it's a must, but you can't compromise too much if you want to have the high quality. Or if you speak about uh, uh, Deepa Danraj films, for example, I mean, she works a lot with women. She made so many films with women who are fighting for their rights, for their uh, way to, to, to stand for themselves. And she and her husband found a way, who is her, her camera person, found a way to be close to these women, to be not to observe them. They're all sitting on the floor uh, it's a Muslim community, they're discussing, they're being very open, and she, he is very much in their face, but they are open and they are shot with the respect. It's also very important when you, when you talk about these uh, uh, films that talk about social justice and uh, political issues and so on. And one more thing is about Indian directors that I respect so much, they're, they're uh, independence, like look uh, Anand Patwardam, he, he fought for every film to be screened. Independence in making, but also 
in trying to show the film. Because we know that system is not working in, in showing documentaries. It's so difficult. That's why these pockets on different television is very important to keep. And, and I really, uh, when I lived in India, I was also watching PSBD uh, and, and the small half an hour slots. I hope they are bigger now than before. Uh, so Anand was fighting and show at the same time for every film to be screened. And then also, and he and many other directors went with the projector, with the, with the computer to screen to many villages, to many places. That's the way how the film, documentary film can be really, can matter and it does matter and it really touches people and it can change, uh, you know, bit by bit how people think. It won't change reality because nobody's going to change the, 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 the establishment of the country. But if you, you put in people's mind kind of worm to think and to question, because documentaries have to question. They have to pose important questions in exciting way. So if people start questioning, then next time when they vote, next time when they go somewhere to choose a representative, they will think twice whether this person is good or not. Documentary has to show really, and they do, the temperature of the society. You know, how, the, how society breathes, what is the, what is happening there and to bring these important topics on the table to be discussed because film directors they are smart people they are narrators they're philosophers at the same time poets very often uh, able to to make exciting essay as well they're very much uh, literate in the the frame of uh, art visual art knowing how to frame how to choose good colors for the film and so on. But at the same time, there are people who have guts to be uh, brave enough to bring something that is not yet discussed, but they see as a danger. So they are one step ahead of everybody else, of the politicians, maybe 10 steps ahead, and of you know common men. So documentaries have a huge huge uh, role in the society. And I don't think that uh, society still reached, that, that they reached uh, the level when, where they can understand the, the importance of documentaries and the power of documentaries, what they can do. And they can do really miracles, I would say. We have a film in uh, Bosnia by Jasmin Rajbanic who won uh, Berlinale, for example, and whose film was also running for Oscars, whose film opened uh, IFFK in Kerala last year, and so on. So uh, she made a film about women raped in the war as a part of war strategy. And these women before this film were never considered as uh, uh, victims, as invalids. I mean, uh, yes, as victims, but not as war invalids. So the mental problems that they had was not seen in the same way as uh, people who were uh, fighting or who lost their leg or, or arm and so on. They, they, they didn't have any support in the society. But since this film brought this topic to be discussed, things changed and now they are included. So they have a social support, they have a trajectory to follow, uh, psych psychotherapy and uh, many, many other things. So things do happen. We have to believe that they do happen. Right. Okay. So tell me something, Rada, as somebody who's been curating for such a long time, you're a programmer, uh, you know, you're a jury person. What are the things that you're really looking for? You know, what, what really moves you about a film, you know, when you're watching? And, and there are so many great films. And yeah. we're constantly wondering, okay, why did this get here and not that one, you know? So what do you, what kind of a hat, what kind of a lens are you wearing when you're looking at films? Yeah, I, I'm not looking at the, at the topics as such. Like I want topics on, I don't know, um, migration or topics on uh, inclusion of certain community in the society and, and exclusion or whatever. Uh, it's not like that. And I mean, it's more like filmmakers react to what is happening 
and I'm there to observe what is well told, what can be shared on the highest level of cinematic quality with the audience. So I'm also not uh, somebody who thinks that uh, curators should cater the audience, that audience should determine what kind of films we should watch or what kind of topics we should watch. No, I think that filmmakers are smart enough, film producers are smart enough to hit the moment of the society. And I'm there to watch as many as possible and to research. Sometimes people don't even uh, apply to festivals. Sometimes they are invisible, they're shy, they are living in, in, in some small places. They're interested to make the film and, and, and address their own community, but they don't think going far abroad is necessary for their film. So I am here to find them. And I'm here to bring them uh, further to their, uh, you know, in, on, on their path of filmmaking to other country, to big festival. And it's happening. I'm very proud that I brought so many good Indian filmmakers to ITFA and to Rotterdam Film Festival. We had films winning these big festivals coming from India. I mean, fiction and documentaries. So I think uh, Sanal, uh, Shashi Dharan from Kerala, who made uh, Sexy Durga and won Rotterdam with this film. It's a fiction, but set up with very much in the documentary kind of environment. Uh, he said it's, it's a bigger problem to screen your film in India than even to make the film. He said, if you have a good script, maybe there will be some donors to support. But you meet so many obstacles at home to screen the film. And I think that's something that Indian uh, communities should work on, that, that the, the system kind of internal system should exist that really these important films reach the audience. So let's just see now a trailer of Writing with Fire, one of the top documentaries. I mean, I have to say, you have to be lucky also to go so far because there are so many ad, other good films coming from India and great directors. And I mean, uh, you know, sometimes it happens that they win awards, sometimes it doesn't. But let's see, Payal Kapadia is also one of directors who won awards at ITFA and Khan. And he, I mean, she's young and she's already on the top of the world with her work, but her work is something different. Ekta Mittal is also, uh, you know, being screened at ITFA in many big places, and she has, she makes different type of documentaries than others. Then Prantik Basu from from uh, Bengal, he also won awards at uh, Rotterdam Festival and makes different type of documentaries than uh, in the films than everybody else. And then of course we have so many other fantastic documentary makers. I can't mention them all. Uh, like Nishta Jain is known on the documentary scene in the world totally, and, and uh, Panka Johar and uh, Kush Buranka and Minai Shukla and uh, Sabadevan, of course, Deepa Danraj and mentioned Anand Patvardam, who is like a father of, you know, engagement uh, movement in documentaries and Ramani who makes so many films and uh, Shili Abraham, Amit Madesha, and, uh, and there is one director I want to mention, Velu Vishwanathan, he lives in Paris, he's from Kerala, from uh, Tamil Nadu, he's a painter. He also makes fantastic films, essayistic films, totally different than, than many other. And he was selected for many festivals. And there are so many, many names from India on the world map that really, really matter. But let's congratulate again now to uh, the makers of uh, Writing with Fire. In fact, you know, we started um, these uh, public chats with them. And next month, we're going to get Shonok, whose film has also done very, very well, uh, to join us. So Wonderful. Uh, let's, Wonderful. let's watch Writing with Fire. Wow. <laughs> हमने अभी तक वो फोन चलाया भी नहीं है डर लग रहा है कि कहीं बेगर ना जाए कहीं कुछ ना हो जाए ऐसा समय ही आ गया है कि उसके बेगर हम नहीं आ, मतलब पीछे रह जाएंगे मुझसे तो पूछते हैं तो मैं भी पूछ लेती हूं कि आप कौन से कास्ट के हैं अब वो कहते हैं मैं ब्राह्मण हूं तो मैं भी कह देती हूं मैं भी ब्राह्मण हूं 
जो खबर लिखनी होती है उसमें पैसा नहीं लगता है इसलिए हमसे उतनी ही बात करी जितना समझ में उससे ओवर हमारे प्रदेश में दलित औरतों का पत्रकार के रूप में कोई सोच भी नहीं सकता चौदह साल में हमने इस मानसिकता को काफी हद तक बदला है इन दमंग लोगों ने क्या किया उसको पत्थर मार कर हत्या कर दी और किसी पर भरोसा नहीं एक लहरिया ही ऐसे न्याय दिला सकती हो एक हैरान वाली बात है कि थाने को पता नहीं पुलिस स्टेशन को पता नहीं है क्योंकि मैं उस जगह से हूँ मेरे लिए तो बहुत ही रिस्की है कभी ग्यारह बजे कभी बारह बजे कोई टाइमिंग है नहीं है इस जगह पे मैं हूँ उस जगह पे अगर आप होते तो क्या करते पहले अपना काम बाद में करते मुझे तो नहीं लगता है जो आपके साथ संगठन है वो देश के भविष्य में किस तरह भागीदारी में संगे शक्ति कल युग है संगठन है संगठन में शक्ति हो डर लग रहा दीदी अभी तो <laughs> खबरें कहाँ गयी कोई खबर दिखी नहीं रही है जो हमारी कवरेज होगी वो अन मीडिया से बहुत अलग होगी हर कोई को जानना चाहिए कि हाँ हम पत्रकार थे एक महिला पत्रकार और किस तरह की पत्रकारिता हमने की है मेरा दिल हौसला देता है मेरे लिए <laughs>
and originality, of course. You, your film has to be original. It has to be different than other films about similar or the same topic. For example, you want to make a film about your grandmother. Fine. But there are an, another 300 films already made in the last 10 years. Good films about different grandmothers in different parts of the world. Or prison. That's a very popular topic among people. Prison in every country, prison in different cities, prison among different population, and so on. But it has to be original. It has to be different, that, which means that the filmmaker has to make research what has been done and see in what way is this different. OK, it's in India. It's not in, uh, in, in Russia. But OK, what, how, what is different then? Well, I mean, how do we see this difference in the film? So what is your cinematic approach? That's the whole point. You can make film about something very simple, very uh, small, let's say. It doesn't have to be a big story. It has, doesn't have to be war story or a big migrant story or political fraud or something. It can be a small story about um, Archana, for example, Patke made a film about love, about her family. Did I say her name properly? Archana from Mumbai. She made, she made, she worked with Abhay Kumar. They made a, a beautiful film about family, about how they live together, and um, about love between these family members and, and, and other things that happen there. The thing is, in the proposal, we look for originality, freshness, this uh, unique voice of the filmmaker, her or her, his way of using the cinematic language. So what you have to write, logline, has to be very simple. Writing a logline is also very difficult. Usually we work at the workshops for days on a logline. Uh, it has to be simple, right to the point and, and exciting the reader. So it doesn't have to cover everything in the film. Of course, not, that's not possible, but it has to be something that excites the, 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 the viewer. And uh, I, I will actually, I found somewhere uh, interesting blog line from a film, Last, Sophia's Last Ambulance. Um, I will just read now. It says, there are 13 ambulances in Sofia, capital of Bulgaria, whose population is nearing 3 million people. That's a log line. But you see, we have 13 ambulance cars and 3 million people. You see, there is a problem there. We can already, we can, we can uh, understand just from the simple sentence that the drama is coming. So the log line is important. Synopsis is very short. People write so much. They don't distinguish what is the background, what is the synopsis of the story. And then the treatment, how you want to tell the story. So there is a what you want to tell and how, and whether this how fits what. So it's not so complicated at the end, but it's difficult to put in words. And that's why it for fund has given a uh, now number of words because people would, if you say A4, then people just write in smaller letters and then they write the huge text. But now it's a, it's a, you know, limited to number of signs that everybody has to kind of, when you push somebody to think more and to summarize and to be more clear and to write less, it's coming clearer to yourself. That's why these workshops like uh, Doc Edge, it's not about tutors only. It's about time that we spend together and that we tell to each other stories and that you as a filmmaker tell to me and to another colleague and to seventh colleague story all over. And we write, ask different questions. And then when you come at the end of the day, summarize everything, you your, yourself have a lot of questions to answer for yourself, not for the tutor, for yourself. And with this, you are sharpening this diamond that you have in your hands. Because very often Indian filmmakers find interesting stories. And Indian reality is so exciting, so dramatic, so turbulent. 
in all aspects, not only politically, not only socially, but in all ways. And the stories are there and we'll make her see them, they pick them up, they want to observe them and they have to sharpen this diamond to make really something that will shine so far internationally that everybody can see. So that's what we are looking for in this um, in these proposals. Like uh, uh, this filmmaker, Sofia's Last Ambulance, I mentioned because it's a Bulgarian director whose film won like 15 years ago documentary uh, award in Cannes. And he made the film being totally shot just from the one ambulance car. Uh, the cameras were on the window and uh, facing the driver and the nurse and the doctor. And they went all night and all day, just in different uh, days, looking, I mean, helping to these cases, unfortunate cases, people in need. But why, so, why he made this fantastic position of the camera? Because he spent three months with them without camera. He was three months with them, day and night, in the car, as a, as a fly on the wall. He observed. And when, then, when he came with the camera, they didn't look at the camera anymore. So he, they looked at him, and he was just one of them. So there was no problem for him to, to stay uh, fixed in this car. So in this uh, proposal, he, for example, mentions why fix cars. So then he explains in two sentences why he wants to keep that. Uh, he, he makes chap chapters, like what is the context of Bulgaria is a EU country, but it's a rather uh, poor EU country. So he explains that why people don't have more ambulant cars and why there are no doctors there and why doctors' uh, salaries are so little that the same doctor who works so hard has to be also auto mechanic in the night, in the spare time. So he explains the context, which context is not a synopsis. It's not a story, it's a context. And then he says narrative. Narrative, just a few lines in the narrative. He explains what is happening. And then he explains form, format of the story. That's the treatment. What is, how you are telling the story? And then, he says also, how will Sofia's last ambulance engage with the international audience? Then he tells us, which is very helpful, why, how should we look? Where is the place for such a film on international audience? He's, uh, he's kind of suggesting us, which is good, which is good. He's not manipulating, he's suggesting. And then he says current status of the project and timeline for complete. Then director's motivation. It's very important in motivation to really show your why it's important that this film is made. So he made this film just in the car. It's like 90 minutes film. He doesn't go out maybe twice only for a short while. And it's a very, very exciting film that shows social situation in one country. So maybe we can uh, see the trailer of Sofia Slam's Ambulance. The director is called Ilian Metter. Чува снима, мило, а? Вот и 
си се някога нападавали нейка? Не. Никога е интересно, не ти е? Не. Не ти е интересно? Не. Искаш ли да пееме? Не. А? Не. Айде да пееме, вместо, вместо да ни боли, ние ще пеем и ще вземеме болката. Искаш ли? Не. Що? Кой е фласка? Първи. Цели ли гардеробта за клуб? Ти си стагал като костенурка. Няма. Всичко е наред. Готово. Да, знам, че много се разруши. Няма. Край, край. Това са последните дубки. Броиме ги. Една. Няма. Няма пиле. Няма мило. Няма. Една. Две. Yeah, so the filmmaker was brave enough to stay with his idea. Everybody was telling him, no, you should go out, it will be boring to stay in the car. But he was firm to stay with his idea. And the film was really good at the end. And he went to so many festivals, won so many awards. And yeah, that was his first international big, you know, coming out right. to the scene. So, uh, Rara, you know, that, that is really about, um, you know, the story you want to tell, uh, the form it will take. But a lot of times, you know, one also gets very confused. You know, when do you stop filming? When, when do you know that you're ready to get into the edit, you know? What is the narrative? And, and that is also a critique sometimes, you know, of, um, of, of especially when you're applying for film funds, you know, where it's almost like you have to create a, a narrative arc in advance, you know, you have to sort of, you know, play, give a sense of how it's going to play out. What are your thoughts about that? You know, where, you know, what do you suggest when you work with filmmakers as a mentor? You know, when do you know that the film is done? You know, when is the story complete? Hmm. I don't think uh, that uh, uh, one should have in mind funds so much. Uh, I think uh, one should really have in mind own feeling. When do you think your film is done, where you should go to the uh, editing room? I mean, there are two uh, parts of uh, two possible ways of applying. You apply for development where you didn't start production, and then you can apply also for production or post-production. So uh, they also ask you in the development application to write the narrative. And very often people say, I don't know, it's a documentary. I will see only when I go there. But that's not the way how creative documentaries are being made. You know, there is a difference between film documentary reportage and the uh, creative documentary. Creative documentary is an art form. It's not journalism. It's not item for uh, coverage on TV or uh, in, in the newspaper. If you think uh, that you can write an article about the same thing, about the same story, then write an article. It's much better, much cheaper, much faster than to film the story that you can put in the article. If you think you can make a radio program, not uh, about the same, do that. So it's not talking heads only. It can be, but it's not only. So filmmaker has to have vision what he or she wants to make in the film, what they want to do, or what they want to say with the film. So, you know, one of the top uh, filmmakers in the world, Pirio Honkasalo, uh, she is Finnish director, so I will just repeat, Pirio Honkasalo. She made also one film in India, Atman, but she made so many beautiful films. One of her top films is Three Rooms of Melancholia, and I advise everybody to watch this film. It's a fantastic film. Once I ask her where her film is coming into being, like some people say at the shooting, my, my film unfolds, I see what's happening. Some people say, oh, I shoot everything and then I editing room, my film comes into being when I see the material and so on. She said, no, my film is made in my head, in my mind, on the couch at home. When I lie on my couch, I close my eyes and I see my film. I see my whole film without going there. But of course, research has been done. That's the thing. If a research is missing, 
then you can't know if you haven't been there, if you didn't talk to people and research hasn't been done. But if research is done, then you feel what you can expect to happen. You can wish things to, to happen and you try to get these things that you wish. Of course, you should be open as a good filmmaker for the life is coming to you, changing things, uh, giving you gift. Sometimes, you know, there is a saying that filmmaker needs a talent, but also uh, God's blessing to give you something unexpected at the moment when you are shooting at the spot. So you go there, but if you don't know what you want, you don't know how to take it. It's there, but you don't see it because you are excited, you are in stress. There is a, there is a whole team with you, the crew, the rain, the problem, the car, the lack of money, uh, heat or whatever. You know, there is a lot of stress at the shooting day. You should, you should be prepared. You shouldn't be thinking, oh, what I'm going to shoot now and what is the next shot? No, you should be prepared and then you can, that's creative documentary because you create your film. What, what I'm looking for as a film selector, festival selector, programmer, or somebody in the committee, I'm looking for the filmmaker behind. So if we come to the film about grandmothers or prisons, I'm looking to the filmmaker behind. What this filmmaker, particular filmmaker, can offer? What it, what is, in what way is it different? So I'm always interested in person who is making the film. And that's why there are so many uh, different films. So such an originality. You know that uh, Nishta Jain made the film uh, 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 about pink sari, ladies in pink saris, and Kim Longinotto made the same film. Kim Longinotto is a top filmmaker in the world, known to everybody, to all festivals. So Nishta Jain is also known, but not as much as uh, Kim. And it happened that they made this, that they picked up in the same year, almost the same topic. And these pink ladies are this group, so they cannot be green saris, because it's, it's pink saris. So it's a similar topic, similar story, but they made two different films because each of them is talented filmmaker with their own originality, with their own minds, and they couldn't know what is doing uh, the other one. And they came out and a lot of festivals wanted to see them both and to screen them both. So there is something that, you know, what is this gaze? Gaze of outsider like in Longinotto or insider like Nishta. So each of them has their own fantastic creativity and they invested that in the film and, you know, the film lived their life both of films. So we uh, in, the, in the committees, we look really for the talent of the filmmaker, originality of the filmmaker, this, this uniqueness, and the, the, the take that the filmmaker is taking while talking about such a story, such a topic relevant. Of course, the relevance of the story is important. I mean, this is something that you cannot avoid. You had a lot of films about Syria, about migration in Europe. You, you will have now films about Ukraine. That's just how it is. That's life. That's something burning. And, uh, and uh, I mean, one can say that the certain topics from India are being more appreciated abroad than some other topics, which is true and maybe uh, for filmmakers unfortunate, but it's normal, you know, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's human also. If we want to hear a story from India, then we want to see something very, uh, I, I'm not saying stereotypical, that's not, that, that, that's bad if it's, you know, if we look for stereotypes and, and confirm stereotypes about certain country, that's not good. But something which is hot spot in India, which is talked about uh, so much that even abroad we, we hear about, or maybe it's, it's something so exciting that we didn't hear about, but we find it interesting. So a lot of um, stories from Indian filmmakers have been supported by Itfa Berta Fund. And Itfa Berta Fund, I don't know uh, whether many people know about them, but they should look at the website. It's very simple. And it's something that we can really uh, 
maybe go through when we watch uh, some some trailer now maybe Purnima can find the Itfa Berta fund on a website we can open now also online and go through it's very easy uh, what, what is required it's not difficult to apply there are two uh, rounds in a year there are applications for the, um, the development and for the post-production, production and post-production, then you can also collaborate with the international producer from Europe, and then you have right again to apply. So there are a lot of uh, possibilities and there are other funds as well. So I think Indian filmmakers uh, should be yeah, proactive and look for all these possibilities because unfortunately they are not there in India, but abroad they are and uh, Indian directors are uh, respected uh, abroad as a, as a good passionate uh, workers also they take a film and they finish the film that's also very important they are reliable people who have a great talent right. uh, Radha we have a few questions uh, being sure. asked in the Q&A uh, box and and uh, if, if there are other questions, please do put them in the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so we have Bilal, I think you know Bilal. Uh, so Bilal asks, why is it so difficult for Indian filmmakers to show their films on European TV uh, in the West, uh, while you know films from Europe or the West are easily broadcast? Why yeah. is that so? So that's one question. Yeah, well, I, I can immediately ask, uh, I mean, reply, I, it's difficult to say like this, we, we should have some statistics. If Bilal would tell me, you have uh, from the Netherlands, uh, this number of films in one year broadcasted on, a, let's say, public television in India, and in, 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 the, in the Netherlands, this many Indian films, then I could say, because I don't think that... Uh, uh, that Indian films don't come. They do come. Uh, of course, uh, American films are dominating everywhere. So in uh, Western Europe as well. So I could also say that there are not enough Eastern European films on the Western television. So Bilal, I, I, I agree, could be more, but they are coming. And only, I don't know, India is a big country, so maybe people are not uh, aware whose film reached German television or Dutch television or Danish television. But every now and then I watch uh, Dutch and, and, and the Belgian TV on my, in my home. And uh, I see they're coming and, and uh, yeah, I mean, they are, they are noticed, they're noticed. Right, right, right. Also, I think rather the fact is that India doesn't have a mature documentary market. So, you know, you don't have um, distribution companies, for instance, who yeah. pick up yeah. Uh, documentary yeah. Yeah. sometimes they act as the bridge between yeah. exactly that's important the uh, the films that are being circulated now they are usually having foreign sales agent uh, not indian i mean there, there there were some attempts to develop that in india also but uh, still it's very small I, what is necessary in india i think and what is one of reasons why people uh, hesitate to bring more Indian films, especially documentaries abroad, is the lack of data of one institution that I can call by phone or email and say, okay, can you please give me uh, email of this director or tell me how I can trace this and that film or do you have this film? Can you send me preview link for my viewing and so on? If you don't have that, it's very difficult to find people in India, where are they? And all other countries have this institute. So that's not film fund, it's a film institute. Like uh, Austrian Film Institute, for example, uh, sends me as a selector for Sarajevo Film Festival, for example, set of films and saying, we think that these films would fit for Sarajevo Film Festival. You can view them on this platform with these passwords, uh, uh, call us back or uh, email us. It's so easy, it goes so smooth and the film is selected. Then you just say, okay, this film is selected. Film is there in no time. Negotiation goes very fast. Indian, uh, India doesn't have this institution and this is really, really necessary. Maybe there, is, there could be something organized among filmmakers themselves. Uh, if you if you wait for the institution, who knows if it will come and when it will come. 
So this is something that people are hesitant to start, you know, like, uh, let's say, let's curate a program of Indian cinema. I did curate program for, for ITFA with 17 documentaries, but it was difficult, difficult to find spelling of the names of people, difficult to find good fo photo, st film still. Uh, you know, there, is, there must be somebody to, to help you from the institution. And, uh, you know, why not go to Argentina or Brazil where things are better organized and take their program? If they already, you know, have place where you can go and help you. So that's something that is very important. It's a, it's, it looks as a small thing, like lazy foreigners, they don't want to invest, but it's a big job to curate a big program and help from inside is necessary. Um, we have two questions uh, about the creative documentary. You know, how are they different from journalistic documentaries? Both Bilal and Sangeeta want to know. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they are they are different in uh, approach of the filmmaker. Uh, creative documentaries, <clears throat> unlike uh, journalistic uh, uh, coverage of a certain topic, that has to have to be objective that has to have both sides. If we have a conflict, we have to see the both sides. In a, in a creative documentary, we have to see how the filmmaker understands this topic, what she or he wants to tell me. So that both sides and objectivity is not uh, necessary. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I'm not saying the filmmaker should lie. I'm saying that filmmaker is allowed to be subjective. And there's the thing, art is subjective. Art is telling me from a subjective eye certain thing, and I, as a film viewer, am receiving in my subjective way and interpreting in my subjective way, which is fine. That's, that's art form that we can discuss, that we can look uh, in a different way. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, we can all understand certain topic in million different uh, you know, versions. That's not the thing. But journalistic piece is covering the topic. You know, there was, um, I don't know, not, not to mention some, but very often there is a misunderstanding. What is documentary film and what is a documentary reportage or, or coverage, journalistic coverage of a certain topic. But they both have a value and they are both important. They both are not easy to make, but in a journalistic piece, you don't need research of uh, uh, three years or uh, one year somewhere. You can uh, read about in newspaper, you go there to this village with, with you talk to people and you understand and so on, you make a contact. Next time you come with a team, you can shoot for 10 days and you come to the editing room and that's about it. But film, you really need a bigger research. You have to stay in this village. You have to ob observe the village. You have to understand how you understand communication between these people. You have to understand how light is moving in this village in, in September, October, when they're going to shoot, for example, because it's very important also for the film. So where is the camera? Is camera here or is camera five meters left? So it's not the same, but in a journalistic uh, piece is not always necessary to know is camera here or five meters on the left. So the difference also is in a, who, who you address, I mean, you address in a journalistic piece, broader audience within certain program. So you have to fit within certain program. In reportage also, you have to, it's broadcasted on TV as a certain value within the, the structure of TV. And the piece, creative documentary, is artistic expression of the, the director. It, it's piece on its own. It can be, it's not placed within something. It's it's a piece of art. So you look at it as an individual expression of this director with whom you can agree, you can like or dislike hers or his work, but it's a piece of art. Right. Um, Rivana asks what the trajectory for documentaries that don't conform to more traditional narrative structures 
you know, what can be the trajectory for such documentaries, you know, given that television, Netflix, you know, those are the new sort of opportunities, but they're also very sort of structured and it's quite narrow, actually, the kind of, uh, you know, stories yeah. they're looking for. So, yeah. so other than filmmakers, what else can film, you know, filmmakers do other than yeah. film festivals? Yeah, hello, Rebana, and congratulations. Uh, Rebana made a fantastic film, Ladies Only, and, and it's now screened in Sheffield, and it was at Berlinale, and it's really, she's one of these uh, uh, bright um, talents that is yet to come and be, be really uh, future masters of documentary cinema, together with, uh, with many other names. Aria Rota also and many other. Um, I would say that unfortunately there are not so many places. There are cinemas, of course. We have to fight for cinema play, space. Uh, the documentaries come to cinema as much as fiction films. And there are some countries where it's happening like in the Netherlands, I think in Germany also, uh, where people buy ticket for 10 euros, 11 euros to watch a documentary film. Uh, Writing with Fire is at the moment in cinemas in the Netherlands. Again, some cinemas screening, it was already. So that's one place. Secondly, we forget that there are so many institutions that observe life on the academic level or research level for whatever reason, I think we have to provide them with, with our films and we can charge them also um, whatever amount for our films, for film links, for their research archive. I know that uh, Anand Patwardam, for example, has a, or used to have a distributor in, in uh, New York, his sales agent, and I spoke to him where Anand's film go, and he said a lot to the different institutions, different universities in America. So many of them, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, and they all research, you know, different things, political, social, anthropological, uh, philosophical, cultural, so many different things, visual arts, you can, you know, research a dialect from certain place in, in linguistics departure, in a very political film, but you research something else. So I, I think proactivity of the filmmaker is necessary there because unfortunately there is not one institution that would do for you this work. And uh, sales agents can do a lot if you choose a good sales agent. And um, the film unfortunately becomes very easily old to go to the festival. Some festivals take only film that is 12 months old. Some films take maybe two years for the competition still, but this shelf life, also some films have this long shelf life because they they talk about the topic. And I certainly think that Trebana's film is one of these that will have a long shelf life that can come again and again on television, can come again to some curated program. They, they won't be forgotten. Only we have to know where is the shelf, in which place is the shelf that we can Google and find her film. So a lot of input from filmmakers themselves in this department. Right, so it's not, it's not easy really, and there are no ready answers. Every film will have to figure out its own route in a way. Right? Yeah. Um, we have a question from Gitanjali, who in fact is one of the mentees um, at the doc commune program that we have right now. Uh, and she asks uh, that, uh, you know, how do you approach the non-creative parts of the proposals? Uh, can you expand on high quality cinema? Does it also have to do with technical and financial as aspects apart from the creative? Um, well, no. Uh, Radha, if I can just interrupt, you know, another question that a lot of people keep asking is how important is the choice of camera? Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, that, that's again a question that keeps coming up. I, I don't think that we have to uh, blame inability to choose uh, to have good camera for our not successful film. Uh, of course, it's important. You know, but it's a package. So 
sometimes we see films with the fantastic production. It's all flashy and it's fantastic uh, visuals, but it's empty film. So they don't succeed. You know, it's good to have both. You know, it's like a beautiful person. It's nice to have somebody in a very nice dress, but even in a, in a very modest dress, the beauty of the person will come out somehow. So technical aspect is not the key aspect. You can't have a, a technical problem in your film, like sound that you can't hear well, uh, image that you can't see well, that is uh, all the time has some disturbance or something, unless it's necessary why it is in the film. Even this is tolerated, you know, we, we have surveillance images and we tolerate this moving and not being sharp and not really seeing properly if the director is suggesting that we should see something and this is very important for the, for the drama. So if the film is correct and if you, if you achieve your beauty, visual beauty by, you know, taking care of the light, of framing, of uh, um, duration of the shot in editing room also, and so on. That, that's something, that's how you build this inner beauty of the film itself. So technical aspect uh, is important, but is not determining whether film will pass or not. This non-creative part in application, uh, it, it's, I mean, you, you, you write about uh, uh, background, which we can say maybe it's not so creative part if you write about historical part or a, or a political part or a, you, go, you give a context and so on. It has to be clear. It has to be, again, very clear, simple, how it's explained. But what is very important in the, uh, in the proposal is the trailer. And that's where many people fail. Because they think I'm developing, I was not there yet. How can I have a trailer? I don't have any money. But it's not, nowadays with mobile phones, it's almost unforgiven not to have a trailer. You are looked uh, as a not being very, you know, prepared, well, eager to go and to invest everything and to put energy and so on. If you don't have anything, I would like that we now watch. Uh, Oh, this uh, Hiroko Okada trailer, uh, she is the one who doesn't have anything, but she found a way how to tell us that she doesn't have anything. So let's just watch this trailer. And before the trailer starts, I can, are we ready with the trailer or? Because I can talk more when the trailer is, till the trailer is ready. Emma, let us know if you have the trailer with you. Video work last year. Title Love and Hate Lunchbox. I will show you this at the festival. I am Japanese. I am a mother. My son is six years old. My artwork is not only videos, but also paintings, installations. I got involved in theater when I was young. This experience influence what my artwork so I have tried it such a unnatural promotion video histrionic self introduction thank you Okay, so, so this filmmaker found a way how to be, you know, creative and surprise us and to, uh, you know, she, she didn't propose documentary, she proposed uh, some uh, visual art piece. But I'm saying she didn't have anything and she found a way to still capture our attention.
Uh, so, so there are so many ways, you know, there are pitches that are being sang as a song, you know, people come, it has to do with the film also. I mean, you can't just uh, invent something which is totally, uh, you know, not proper. But if you are inventive, creative in a, in a pitching moment, whether personally or, or uh, uh, in a written form, you can also send very more and more often people now send video pitch, you know, so they, they we can see them also to the fund um, and also visuals along. So uh, either you make a mood board in the film, in the proposal is not enough. And usually people just very uh, offer a kind of eclectic, you know, collection of photographs or uh, they take uh, photos from best films in the world. So of course the, the stills are good, but you that, that they don't guide you because they are eclectic. So is it this or is it that? And you know, so it, that's not the best way. It's better to show two, three photos or drawings or something that you can understand how the film will look like, where it will take you. And of course you can't provide much, but with your mobile phone, you can you can create something even when you don't go to this village, which is 500 kilometers far from you and you don't have money and you, you can do similar uh, environment, for example, and shoot something, or you can say, send your previous uh, film and say, this is my style. I will follow the same style in this film. If previous work doesn't work, if it's only previous work, but only if it's connected to the next film that you are proposing. So there are many ways how you can be creative and how you can uh, keep the attention of the audience. I mean, what, what is all, it's all about actually, you know, seduction. It's, we have to be aware of the fact that there are more than 15,000 documentary films made in one year and maybe 500 at the end circulate everywhere and maybe 50 are invited to all, almost all festivals and so on and as Viktor Kosakowski says it's not enough to make good film we have to make excellent films because there are so many good films you see so if we want to make a film we really have to do effort to seduce the committee in some way and then your audience also in a sense that you keep attention I mean seduce in the best way of the world, the positive way. So, so you have to keep attention of your committee and of your audience later on by uh, rethinking, how can I tell this story? How this story, it's very important story. So how can I tell? So maybe we can now uh, show the fragment of, uh, we, we have time for that or? Yeah, for 72 days, it's a film that maybe it's close to Indian directors in a sense that it's a, a political story, very uh, dangerous to be told in a, this society. It's a Belarus where they have a, this president Lukashenko for so many years. It's everything is forbidden. They put people in jail when they tell certain stories and so on. So this is a film of, the, of a female director. Uh, he, she also recorded herself in this speech. So actually it's a little bit longer, uh, like seven minutes. Is that too long? Okay. okay. Hello, my name is Anna and I'm from Belarus. I am the director of the documentary 72 Hours. Hi everyone, I'm Isabel de la Serna, producer at Playtime Film based in Brussels. We would first like to invite you to watch the trailer and meet our main protagonist, Luba. President Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus says two people have confessed to Monday's deadly metro bombing. Many Belarusians mourning the victims are mystified over the reasons for the bombing, 
Abroad, one London-based think tank was amazed at the speed of the police operation. Usually, investigations into terrorist attacks take time, it said, noting what it called the highly politicized nature of the incident. <laughs> L'Europe est aujourd'hui un espace où la peine de mort est presque totalement hors la loi. Presque, parce que le Belarus manque encore à la peine. Это особенно опасно в стране, где нет независимого суда. Большинство не верило результатам суда. Меньше чем за год моего сына арестовали, пытали, судили и расстреляли. Меня не покидает чувство, что а вдруг. Следователь позвонил, сказал, чтобы я Владу привезла вещи и дал трубочку Влада. Естественно, я была в таком состоянии, плакала, я не могла толком поговорить с сыном. Он мне сказал, мама, не волнуйся, все будет хорошо, через 72 часа все решится, все, все выяснится. Но эти 72 часа и сегодня. Seventy-two hours is a portrait of a mother whose life is forever incomplete. It is a story of unfinished loss. Yeah, so we, we see here that uh, uh, they are in production and they try to show the proactivity of the film. So they know, they know what will happen. And so they, they cannot put in the film what the future will bring, but there is the proactivity. And that's what is very important that the trailer has to show us the main character that we can see how many character is the communicating with the audience, with the camera, is it loved, is it appealing? Uh, does it does it uh, bring the, this emotional excitement when we watch somebody? And where is the proactivity? We have to promise to the committee that the film will have this proactivity. We don't have to tell the full story. We have to make them, as it said often, make the committee hungry for more. Don't give them everything. Don't serve them, you know, the story like, oh, film is this from A to Z. No, make them hungry for more like, oh, I want to see this film. Very often we, we, you know, in the committee say, oh, I really want to see this film. That, that's a very positive kind of conclusion at the end of the discussion of, of a certain film. So filmmaker can, doesn't have to know everything. And somebody in the chat said, so the, the creative documentary is like a fiction. It is in a sense that it's cinema. So uh, I'm totally, not a person who says there is documentary and there is a film. No, documentary is a film. It's only documentary and the other one is fiction and there, there is animation and so on. So documentary is as fiction in a sense that uses cinematic language in a creative way. But 
operates with elements of real life. And real life is everywhere. And we can look at this real life with the, with the, you know, being framed like this or being framed like that. It's up to us. We are the creators of this frame. And what do you take from a certain story? Where, where do you stop in the editing room? Where do you put music? Where the music is disturbing? It's not that you fake things in front of camera, like in fiction, where you fictionalize things, you have actors and so on. It's, it's real, it's happening real, really. But you can say, of course, in the documentary, you can tell to your character, please move half a meter because the light is better, you know, falling on your face. You're not lying anything then, that's the, this character. Right. Thank you so much, Radha. I think this has been a, a masterclass, really, <laughs> you know, in uh, how filmmakers should go about thinking about their films, you know, pitching, making their films, you know, uh, it, this has just been um, wonderful. And, uh, you know, the good thing is that this, this uh, conversation will be put on YouTube so, you know, more people can have access to it. And that really is, um, you know, our purpose and, and that's our aspiration with, with this entire initiative to have, you know, to, to bridge that information gap. And like, like you said, right, there's this huge information gap in India. And, you know, one of the things that we really want to do is to bridge that information gap. Uh, there are many more questions, but I think some of them are a little too specific to their own film. So I'm going to uh, stay away from them. And it's also, we, we've gone 30 minutes over time. So I, I really think we've, we've uh, you know, really, um, uh, you know, you have indulged us uh, greatly. So thank you so much, Radha, from a one hour conversation. It's a pleasure. For one and a half hours conversation, it's it, become it, a little it, feature it, documentary of its own. So <laughs> it, was, it was a real a pleasure, and uh, I just want to. Uh, I saw in the chat that somebody is asking where we can go to learn how to write proposals and so on. Please go to itfa.nl, itfa Berta Fund. Uh, maybe somebody can write this for everybody. Itfa Berta Fund. Uh, explains how to write proposal, what are the usually uh, the most uh, frequently asked questions. And uh, um, there are examples also there. There are also other funds where you can go. So it is giving you a link where you can go further to some other fund. It's good to, when you send the film to festival to also not just to send to any festival when the film is finished, but, but to Google and see the list, what type of films, then you prevent frustrations if you are not selected. And uh, I think filmmakers should not get into frustrations by being selected or not by being selected. When we talk about money, of course, when you go to uh, the fund, you, you, you want money to make the film and you are frustrated that you cannot make the film, uh, but, I, uh, to learn how to apply and it's good to work on your project by go following certain workshops and in India, uh, thanks to Doc Edge and to uh, Nilotpal uh, Da and, and his team, we now have this platform and there are other platforms in different states of India that also opened up and even in Bangladesh and, and uh, neighboring countries. So there are places where you can apply, where you can go, where you can get uh, uh, advice from your colleagues how to apply. But I'm saying filmmakers should not be uh, frustrated for not being selected if they believe that they did their best in making the film. It's your film. You understand everything what you did in the film. You have uh, uh, reasons behind why you edited in this way, why you shot in this way. So if you are calm and if you say, this is my film, I'm happy with it. I told the story that I wanted to tell. There is no festival committee or programmer that can tell you it's not good. It's not good for them. And there are always mistakes. One film is not selected at one festival, but then wins awards at another festival. Subjective committee, certainly, it is normal. So please don't get frustrated because to make even the bad film is so difficult. But please do your best to do good film because if you put a little bit more effort, if you have a consultant, have your film being watched 
by neutral people. Don't give to your friends to watch your film. Friends are not good. Uh, they don't give, give good feedback. They are your friends. Don't give to your mom and your family. Give to some other people, some, some, some colleagues from your faculty who you don't know that well, how they react, what is clear, what is not clear, why they want this or that, they want more of that. Let's think about what, they, what feedback they gave and then reconsider. So if you think I did my best, don't get frustrated because it's not worth really. We have at a workshop that I'm heading, it's called Dr. Ravkar Boutique. First session is with a sports psychologist who is talking to people about how to distinguish criticism. Criticism from your own feeling criticized as a person from your project being discussed and kind of criticized. So that's very important because that's, Filmmaking is, is also a blessing. So see it as a blessing. You are, you are blessed and fortunate being talented to make the film. So keep it as a gift and enjoy this gift. Don't let you know other people frustrate you, but do your best. Watching other films is very important. Watch as many films as possible. There is a one European uh, platform, it's very cheap. It's six euro, I think, per month, uh, or even they have discounts sometimes. It's called DA, D-A, Doc Alliance, D-A. So they have top films of the world watched, uh, streamed for very cheap. So that's my advice. And uh, yeah, have a good night. Now is four o'clock in, in Europe, in Amsterdam. And uh, I greet you all. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, heartfelt thanks to Imrana and Purnima who are part of the team, uh, you know, who really make all of this possible. And thank you once again, Radha, thank you uh, for all those who joined uh, the session. Thank you for staying and thank you for asking questions. On that note, we'll call it a day. Thank you, Radha. Thank you.